Okay. Hello and welcome to another episode of Money Talks, Making Money Friendly or Making Money Your Mate. Those are the two options for my tagline. What I want to do is explain why cryptocurrencies are better than traditional fiat currencies. How the pound and the dollar are products that they're, the only value they have is in their limited supply. If the government made it so that anyone could get unlimited dollars or pounds, everyone understands that that would just be pointless. There would be no point in having something that with which people had unlimited access to. And I think understanding how the pound and dollar works help you understand why something mathematical like cryptocurrency can actually be a better currency for people to trade their hours of with or their work with or their houses with uh, makes more sense in a savings account than something that can be printed. To explain crypto in the simplest way possible, I'm going to pretend that there's a banana salesman and an apple salesperson. Is the apple person only makes apples from January through till August. Whereas the banana person can make bananas year round. So the apple person during the months of September through to December has nothing to trade with the banana person. So the apple person does something quite simple, quite clever. He prints off an apple coupon. He then gives the apple coupon to the banana person and the, says to the banana person, look, I don't have any apples right now, but in January, when my trees start producing fruit again, you can trade this piece of paper in for an apple. Very, very simple to understand. The banana person is like, okay, great, I like apples, so I'll take your apple currency and I'll give you a banana. Come rolls around January, the apple person makes 10 apples, I know it's absurd, but 10 apples from January through to August and is given the banana person, let's say, five apple coupons so that he can keep some apples himself. However, the banana person perhaps buys only two apples that year with his apple coupons and saves the remaining three. The issue in the case of the apple salesman, for example, is over time, he's given out more and more credit for apples and then the banana person, he's got 10 apple coupons and the, and the apple guy only has five apples. So what does the apple guy do? Well, he starts selling two coupons for one apple. And just in that moment, because the supply of apples didn't immediately jump up with the supply of apple coupons, the banana person now has to sell two bananas for every one apple that he wants. And just like that, the banana person, through having done nothing wrong, is now working twice as hard as the person who's selling apples. That's the issue with the centralised currencies being printed, is the fact that we don't even notice the issues that are occurring with the printing and the supplying of cash until the money is being spent. And the supply of resources doesn't go up with the supply of cash. So the banana guy is unhappy. He's just witnessed the price of apples double and decides that that currency doesn't work. They want to move to a different currency, one in which the apple guy can't easily print. Uh, let's imagine they both accumulate all their gold, put that in a central system. That way, they, when they're trading apples and bananas, the gold is the limiting factor of how many apples and how many bananas each of them can get. This means the apple guy can no longer just indefinitely print coupons whenever he wants resources from the person selling bananas. Both the apple salesperson and the banana salesperson are both using a bimetallic currency. The fact that gold has no applicational value is what's so great about it. It can be sat inside a bank no one actually has a need for it and so when people are trading this limited token it's not preventing anyone from developing any infrastructure or growing crops or resources it just represents value gold is decentralized so there is not one person that controls all the gold gold can be found all over the world so 
the apple farmer and the banana farmer began trading it, both of them had some gold to trade with. See, pretty simple so far, pretty easy to understand. This means come September through December, where the apple guy is not making any apples, he can use the gold he made selling apples to the banana guy during apple season to buy bananas in the winter season. The apple guy, if he doesn't have that much gold, can then conserve how much they're spending, try to sell more apples in the next summer season to the banana guy, and so on and so forth. Both of them are aiming to become more productive, produce more fruit and vegetables in an effort to obtain more gold from each other. Therefore, gold as a currency encouraged production, uh, encouraged growth, encouraged more fruit and vegetables. This is all great, but there is one issue. Gold is heavy, uh, it's not convenient to carry around, and so both of them would have preferred to trade with something that was a little lighter to carry, and they didn't have to worry so much about being stolen. This is when they go to a third person, the banker. The banker holds their gold very graciously and in return gives them paper to represent how much gold they have in the bank. The banker himself never needs the gold, the gold is there to represent value of the apple person's production and value of the banana person's production. The gold is somewhat arbitrary in comparison to this, the gold is just a lump of metal meant to represent the hard work both farmers are putting into production. Therefore, the banker never really desires the gold or has any use for it. The banker, what he wants is bananas and apples in exchange for his service taking care of the gold. However, as the banker does not want to work for free and also doesn't want to charge the apple person or the banana person for their services, he does something quite cunning and he gives prints more paper and gives that paper away uh, representing the gold as a loan to a pear farmer and so he gives £10 of gold to a pear farmer in the form of paper and tells the pear farmer he needs to pay him back £11 over the next year. Therefore the banker is getting 10% return on their loan and then can even give some of that money back to both the banana farmer and the apple farmer as a form of interest. So all really straightforward, pear farmer gets an investment to plant pear trees, the banker gets his paycheck, and the banana person and the apple person all receive nice interest on their assets, on their gold sitting in the bank account. Here's the problem, the banker now wants more money, and so the banker is trying to give out as many loans as possible. The banker is now giving out far more pounds than he ever has in actual physical gold in the bank. Remember, the gold there is arbitrary and useless. What the banker wants is everyone working as much as possible uh, so that he can buy as many things as uh, the banker desires. However, because the banker is giving out so many loans, the prices for the entire market, all the pear trees, the apple trees, the banana trees, skyrocket because everyone is getting loans in order to buy more things and because there aren't suddenly more things the banker has done nothing to actually provide more stuff just more pieces of paper the cost of everything goes up in price and therefore the apple person the banana person who perhaps never needed to get a loan before are now going to their same bank asking for a loan that they would otherwise never have needed a loan of their own money so that they can buy their land or a house or more banana trees or water for their crops. They now actually rely on loans and then paying back the interest in order to survive, rather than surviving on their income and being their own lender, they now depend on that third person, the banker. However, this eventually enormously backfires on the banker when the people eventually come to collect their gold and the banker has simply printed far more pounds than he ever had in gold, uh, people begin to realise that there is more paper money than gold. This is when a currency moves from being bimetallic to fiat currency, as we know it today. This for the US dollar happened in 1970s 
and then one year later it happened to the Great British Pound. So it's only been 50 years since the pound and the dollar, two of the world's biggest, longest, oldest currencies, have moved from being something tangible, attached to gold, and are now simply called fiat currencies, which is just means that their scarcity is controlled by the government and the Bank of England. So aside from being the bedrock of the Great British Pound for hundreds of years, the overnight in the 1970s, gold became completely arbitrary to the cost of the pound, and same for the US dollar. Gold was meant to limit the supply of pounds and dollars. It was meant to prevent bankers from becoming greedy and make sure that we as consumers were not being exploited by central governments. Without gold being the bedrock, prices for everything go up every single year. It, theoretically, you don't need gold to be the bedrock, you just need something limiting the supply and the printing of cash. You need cash to be limited in supply in order for someone's hours at work to be adequately represented in monetary form. If you print off £10 tomorrow, then theoretically you've printed off an hour's, an hours of someone's time. And that's not really fair on that person who's just worked an hour that you can now just, without having done anything, pay them to do another hour's work. Needless to say, this is how the central banks and the government work. So finally, this is where our hero cryptocurrencies come in. Exactly like gold when it first was initiated, it is limited in supply. The only way that we can get more supply of a currency like Bitcoin is if computers use energy to mine for it. And the benefit of the mining is not so that we can get more Bitcoin. Ultimately, we don't really want more Bitcoin. It works just as well as a currency without mining for more of it. The benefit of the fact that there is mining involved is means anyone in any country around the world, so long as they've got a computer, can get access to some of the supply. So it's not one person starting off with all of it and slowly, incrementally dishing it out indefinitely. It's everyone around the world can get access to it and then it distributes fairer and slower and more evenly over time. So it's limited in supply and it's decentralized, just like gold. And another reason it's brilliant like gold is because it is useless. So whereas steel or wheat was often used in the past, you couldn't save these resources in a bank account without taking opportunity away from other people that needed those resources. You wouldn't want your savings account to be a vaccine that people need access to. The thing that you want your savings account to be is something that everyone agrees is valuable and yet has no value. Where cryptocurrency differs from gold in a really important and brilliant way is that you can trade the cryptocurrency directly. We're not trading pieces of paper that represent an asset, we're trading a physical asset limited in supply. I understand that the physical asset is code but the code still represents a limited supply. So, because of this, the apple guy and the banana guy no longer need a banker there. They can both have a computer each and then trade their Bitcoin over the computer. Neither one of them relies on luck for how much Bitcoin they have. If they have similar computers, they will mine for the same amount of Bitcoin. Other coins do not rely on mining in the same way and there are layers of complexity to mining. There are all sorts of ethical and moral factors that can be added to these coins to make them a fairer or more environmentally friendly, but the principle is they behave in a very similar way to gold when it was originally used as an underlying asset in banks except this no longer relies on a banker and it no longer relies on pieces of paper representing an asset, you actually trade the asset itself. Therefore, if the apple person or the banana person sell a good amount of bananas or apples that year, their bank accounts simply go up in Bitcoin or their crypto asset 
and they have the ability to buy more resources to do up their land and then become more profitable and in order to buy more assets to do up their land they'll have to spend their currency and if they want to gain interest on their currency and they want it to be a safe investment well there will be mortgage funds just like there are today it just won't be called interest rates in a bank account it will just be called a low risk mortgage fund a bit like your pension your money might experience occasional dips but nothing compared to the dips and rises we experience today with the rampant money printing by central banks. So I hope that explains how cryptocurrency works on a fundamental level. It's just a piece of code and there is a piece of software that tracks the code going from person to person and it's just a way of us working for a currency but that currency not being controlled by a central bank or a banker, it's impossible for this currency to be supplied for any one person's interests. Thank you.